We have a scandal in free enterprise for a change, and you might have realized the slightly sarcastic tone. It's not really a surprise, but it's time to talk about it because there is a topic which is getting into my inbox for months now. First, I thought it's a couple of people uh, who might have personal situations, and I thought there might be a situation in a certain part of the country in a certain industry, but now looking at the evidence, it's cross-industry, and it's a it's a huge problem. We are talking about professional standards because once more, we had a scandal in the big consultancy world, and with big consultancy, I mean the big names. Um, KPMG now settled the lawsuit. Um, they were sued when, when Carillion, the the public sector uh, bidding company and organizing company went bust and bankrupt. When they went into insolvency, just, just weeks before, KPMG said that all the accounts were fine and suddenly Carillion was uh, was going for insolvency. And of course, people were asking, who is doing the accounts there? So KPMG was sued uh, over £1.3 billion, which is a record amount of money. They now settled it. They admitted that it didn't go well and that the lawsuit would be, and I quote from The Guardian, without merit. And they said it was corporate failure. However, this is not a one-off. If we look into the history, and this is the problem we are going to talk about today, professional standards, do do big names in consultancy basically stand for the big scandals and only for the big scandals? And of course, we need to talk about how to prevent that in the future, not only there, but also for you in your organization, because no matter if you're larger or smaller, there will be some sort of external person consulting your business because from a certain from a certain size, you do not always need people for jobs constantly, which is why you ask external people who you pay temporarily and then they give you advice and then they leave or they are there for a bit of a longer time, an interim mandate. But there are people where you say it's a temporary position for a reason. And that is reasonable. There's nothing bad about that. If we look into the big names of consultancy recently, there were massive issues. So as I said, KPMG settled the 1.3 billion lawsuit over Carillion. McKinsey recently paid more than $500 million in a settlement uh, due to the opioid crisis and their role. And we're talking about opioids. These are medications, severe medications that make people addicted and might ruin their lives. Deloitte paid more than £900,000 over SIG failures in accountancy. Bain Consultancy is actually banned from having any public tender or participate in any public tender due to their role in the South Africa corruption scandal. So we are at the point where companies get banned. And when you now think, what about Accenture? I'm not going down the full list, but when you look into when you look into Accenture, um, when you when you see where they come from, they come from Anderson Consulting. And when you still look into the well documented scandal, Anderson Consulting was involved in the Enron scandal, a scandal about accounting of an energy providing firm, and Anderson Consulting. Um, destroyed evidence evidence that uh, and evidence means documents they destroyed documents that the that the SEC needed uh, to conduct the the in investigation properly so here we are that is not something where you say oh that's a tiny glitch in a software program that is a deliberate help in fraud so how can this happen and how to prevent it from happening in the future very important when we now look into how to do it better a couple of things we have to clarify in the first place so first Never generalize. You cannot say everyone in a big consultancy company is incompetent of what they do, because that is clearly wrong. By the way, when you generalize, it is always wrong. You can never say anything of XYZ is bad. It is always more difficult than giving generalized solutions. These are always pseudo solutions. When you generalize, you lose out. You are wrong. Many people who are there are very smart, do excellent jobs. So you cannot take them into into some sort of um, general decision that you made where you said, in my opinion, anyone who works for that company has no clue of what they're doing there. And that is where we now have to talk about how can we now say what to do. So we don't generalize. There are smart people there, no question about that. But there are, of course, also people who should, probably shouldn't be in the position which they are right now. And let's face it, um, we also have to see it in context when you say all the big scandals are with big consultancy. Well, that is a logical consequence. You will never have a very small consultancy company having a massive scandal because they don't get these gigs. So big consultancy companies get the big gigs, and that means they can also have a higher risk of high failure, massive failure, and press-related failure or press presence failure that you simply get into press where they say that went wrong because no one gives you a press headline when everything went right. When you go to a company 
and they leave and you, you leave and they say, everything's better now. It's just perfect. Thank you so much, consultancy company. No newspaper is going to put a headline out there because they would say, it is just not news. It's advertising. So please put things in perspective. But now we have to talk about issues that are, that are definitely there. We have four issues. Let's say three plus one, three plus one. So first issue is consultancy companies are a white game. They are non-diverse, full stop. When you look on their websites, they try really hard and I appreciate the effort that they do. As I am part of the LGBTQIA plus community, I see all the big consultancy companies um, hovering around on their floats at pride parades, which is fair enough. Thank you very much for the support. But of course, we know that you also um, use it for recruiting and you are fully aware of the fact that many people in the LGBTQIA plus community Many of them do not have partners or children, so you have the benefit that they are more flexible. No children, more productivity. So it is not only about equal and human rights, because otherwise you wouldn't take any mandates in certain countries, which these companies do. So I don't want to call it pinkwashing because it is a bit more it, it, it is a bit more difficult. Some people, some people in, in these organizations have a genuine interest. However, often companies use it for marketing purposes, and that, of course, is problematic. Problem number one, non-diversity. Um, please, when you look into the people who work for you, you often have the same kind of CV. Born privileged, white male state cis cisgender, went to private education, paid by the parents, um, didn't need a side job, everything was paid. And then surprisingly, they managed to get a good master's degree because they didn't have to do anything except going to education. This is just nothing else than reproduction of privilege. These people achieve to stay in the same social class into which they were born. Congratulations. Uh, that is a debatable achievement. So the non-diversity, which makes the whole consultancy game a white one, is the first aspect we have to talk about. And at the end, we're going to talk about how to do it better. Aspect number two, toxic work culture. When you see consultants working 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 hours a day, we all had situations in our organizations or companies where you say, hey, this week is a bit stressful. I just have to go the extra mile and work long hours. And there's nothing bad about that. However, if you constantly do that, it cannot be right because it is an obvious ignorance. It is an ignorance towards scientific evidence. If people do not have enough breaks, if people do not recover from their work, they are not going to work any better. And I can tell you very openly, I do not want to have any piece of advice from someone who constantly works 80 plus hours per week. They are stressed out. They have no social life. They only have the standard solution that you offer. And you know what you do here. When you offer standard solution that you created somewhere and you just put them on any company, no matter what the company is. Today, it's an engineering company. Tomorrow, it's a noodle producing company. You don't care. It's called default bias. Default bias means when you say, oh, they've done it here, so it works with you, there's a high likelihood that people will agree because there's a first case where it happened to work, or at least it was presented to you like it worked. Toxic work culture, problem number two. Problem number three is you simply have people in place who have no experience and no expertise on the matter. Still, even today, I see that consultancy companies get people in who go straight from university into consultancy. And I can tell you, I fully understand when people say I'm not taking advice from these people. When you never worked in the field and you want to tell people how to do their job, it is quite frankly borderline ridiculous. I can tell you that my leadership work is based on being a leader. And you can see that go on my LinkedIn. You can see, and I'm I don't say that to, to show off here. When you go on YouTube and just type in Youth Abundant Award, you see that I was training implementation manager uh, for New Horizon, the largest Microsoft learning partner, working globally, leading multiple locations, and I won an award for obviously doing not too bad. This is not about my ego. It's just a proof of what I've done before. I started my own business. I grew my own business. I had people working for me. And at the end, I just successfully managed to, to sell the business. And we simply have to see that I've been there and done that before I tell people what they should do. However, it seems reasonable for a, 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 a certain level of decision makers to say, we just take people from theory and put them into practice with no proper preparation. And these people substitute or exchange. They simply replace substance. Knowledge, and I, I don't mean substance. <laughs> substance substantial knowledge is simply replaced by self-confidence. 
And when you replace substantial knowledge, the substance of what you deliver is your knowledge, your expertise, your experience. When you replace the substance you have with self-confidence, it simply does not work. And I can fully understand when people sit in companies who, and of course, there are problems on both sides. When you have someone who's in the business for 20 years, they have a strong opinion on how to do business and changing them might be difficult. Not always, but it might be. However, it's not getting easier when someone who has worked zero days in the industry never did anything in the field. And suddenly you put this people, this person in charge to change someone who's 20 years um, who offers 20 years of experience and expertise. It's not going to work. If you put people in place who have no clue what they do, but they have the standard solution and a bunch of self-confidence, which normally was given to them by their private business school, sorry, I simply say thank you, no thank you here. Problem number four, pseudo-consulting. You have leaders and they have a certain decision in mind. However, they are unwilling to make the decision because they think, oh, it could be wrong. So I just play it safe. So you get a consultancy company and you brief them very closely what you want to have. And of course, they still look if you're not wildly wrong because their name, of course, is um, is uh, there as well, is, is involved as well. However, when you're remotely okay, they probably confirm what you do. And I, I just give you a real world example um, it, it was a bank in Germany. I delivered seminars there and they were dealing with quite some crisis and they asked a well-known consultancy company to check what's going wrong. And one of the aspects they were focusing on is international reputation. So the interviews these, these consultancy companies did were very good. Very good interviews, very well structured, very well, very well conducted. The interviews did an excellent job. So it's great up to this point. And then you see that the, the, the bank clearly has no international reputation. It is not known internationally. The only people who work with them internationally were Germans who during their expert years took the bank somewhere because they already knew them from Germany. There is no international reputation. And then, and the client wanted to have a score on the German school metric system, like school marks. One is the best, six is the worst. So the consultancy company said, we're going to give you three, which, by the way, means satisfactory on a German on a German uh, scoring system in school. And I ask, how do you get to the conclusion to give the this this person a three or this department a three? They, they, they very clearly failed to make the bank internationally known. And that does not mean you have to replace them or fire them. But we have to say you failed so far. We have to up your game and we have to change what you do right here. And they interrupt me and say, no, we give them a three, because when I give them a five or six, which is which are the worst marks on the scale in Germany, then um, they probably fire this manager, which means a new manager comes in and maybe they have their own consultancy company. So I give them a three. The manager and the executives will be tremendously thankful until the end of all days. And of course, someone will say, well, now we need someone to help us to be intellectually known. And there we are, the next mandate for the consultancy company. And that was a jaw-dropping statement for me. Obviously giving the wrong result, deliberately, deliberately giving a fake wrong result to a client only to get the next mandate into your books. And that's exactly this pseudo-consulting I'm talking about. It is very clear what is, what is decided in the end, but you get a consultancy company in because leaders don't do their job. And it's obviously frustrating for people. Also, people see that no one is going to make any decision in that way. And when people see no leader here makes any decision, they don't take you seriously. You delegitimize you yourself on a social level. When you are only able to decide when a consultancy company tells you what to decide, you are not a leader. You're basically an administrator of consultancy company PDFs. And now, of course, we have to talk about how to do it better. So problem number one, the non-diversity. What you have to look at are educational biographies. Educational or education biographies work the following way. So for example, when you were born in a very privileged family and you managed to get your master's degree at your beginning or mid twenties, because everything was paid for you, everything was paved, the whole work, even, even entering the job was, was managed by your parents and their network. It's not bad. You're not stupid. You're obviously smart. Otherwise you wouldn't get the degrees. However, you basically managed to stay in the same class you were born in. So you did standard work. If you have someone who, for example, fled from war, entered a different country, learned the language, went through school, got the school degrees because otherwise you can't go to uni, then managed to work on a scientific level at university. And they probably, 
in high commerce only have a bachelor's degree. These people have achieved 10 times more than the privileged person with a master's degree. You always have to see the educational biography. And that means you look at where have they started, where are they now? And this distance is what you have to measure and look into. And that is where you find good people. And of course, sometimes you have to help people a bit in that position. So when you have certain people who say, oh, I would never hire someone with a bachelor's degree, you simply cut people off. You simply say, we want to have, we only want to have privileged people here with their networks and whatnot. You are a white game and you will be called out on it constantly. And by the way, your social status working for these companies will be on a record low level. So the non-diversity will be, and that is, of course, only one part of the solution, will become better when you look at educational at education biographies instead of just looking for labels. And by the way, I could be the first one telling you to look for labels. Go on my LinkedIn. You find proof that I've done stuff at Harvard, MIT, Yale, massive programs, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. I could be the first one telling you look for the labels because it would be in my favor. However, it is just not right to do so. I just give you an example in one IT company, which is one of my clients. They hired someone who studied Chinese language, and they are now doing um, software license management. How did that happen? Well, they looked into the biography of that person. They saw a certain interest. They saw a certain focus, which they considered helpful, how they used IT in process of their studies, and thought, that's a good pick. Pick the person, and it was the right choice, even today. So these educational biographies offer you the, one of the keys to end the non-diverse game you're you're into right now. Ending problem number two, toxic work culture. You obviously need a sustainable work culture, which means you have to end the, tos- the this, this toxic masculinity workload where people say, oh, I work 60 hours. And then someone says, oh, only 60. I did 80. Did, 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 did you have a week off? Ha, 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 only 60 hours. I worked 60 hours during vacation. I worked 80. And then, and then the next one says 100 and 120. One of my friends worked for a major consultancy company telling me that they needed to get a slide deck finished for a presentation next morning, but he needed some sleep. So he went to sleep and and always woke up because they did the following. He sent the slide deck to the partner of the company. Then he went to sleep for 45 minutes, woke up again, got feedback, worked on the slide, went back to sleep for 45 minutes, back forth, back forth four times. Then it was 7 a.m. in the morning and he had to get up because the hotel fortunately was on the other side of the street of the client. When you sleep four times 45 minutes, you are not ready to do anything reasonable for the day. The toxic workload has to end. And I can tell you, I'm not going to take any advice of someone who's just stressed out by the amount of work because these people only tell you, oh, we have these standard PDFs and PowerPoints. Which one do you want to have? Sorry, I, I, I really have to say thank you. No, thank you here. Step number three, problem number three, um, having people in place who have no experience. And we, by the way, always called them uh, MENEP, MENEP, N-E-N-E-P. That's how we called them back in the days with one of my employers. Non-expertise, non-experienced people, MENEPs. These were people who had no experience in the field. They had no expertise in the subject matter. But, and by the way, it's not a problem when you have no expertise and no experience, you can always learn. But these people entered the office and told us, this is the way how we're going to do it. And by the way, we do it like that very quickly, not by tomorrow, but by next week or next month. And of course, we didn't do it that way for obvious reasons. You can only use people and hire people and put people in front of your peers or your clients who have a real world experience. I come from leadership, real world experience, which is why I can deliver leadership, consultancy, training, coaching, whatever you name it, I deliver it. Um, It is, of course, possible that there is an interdisciplinary approach. So for example, certain leadership aspects, and that happens this interdisciplinary aspect, there are certain principles that that um, are applicable across industry. So when you talk about the uh, Maslow pyramid of needs, for example, or the XYZ theory of Douglas McGregor, um, that works in engineering and it works in hospitality, different industries, but it applies to every single person working anywhere. However, some aspects are very specific and then you need to have the experience and the education and the expertise first. So hire people and put people in front of your clients who have the expertise and the experience. However, these people come with a price tag. So anyone on the receiving side, the daily fees will go up when you want to have these experts and they will go up significantly. 
these are the three main problems. The fourth problem is pseudo consulting. And when you have what they call a political mandate, which means someone tells you what you should decide on your on on your consultancy job because they simply need a confirmation of their opinion. We need an end of the political mandates. Leaders have to make a decision. And when leaders make a decision, yes, some some of these decisions might be wrong. And the reaction is not to fire them immediately. The first question always is, how can we fix it? The second question always is, how can we prevent it happening in the future? The third question always is, what did we learn from it? The lessons learned. And only the fourth question. The fourth question is only needed this because the fourth question is, who has done it? Who to blame? You only need this question if, for example, someone violated regulatory compliance or laws, because then either you want to know who did it or you you, you even have to report that because probably they offended a law. You have to report it to, to the public prosecutor and so on and so forth. But there needs to be an end of the political mandate. Leaders have to decide because otherwise no one is going to perceive you as a leader anymore. They will simply consider you someone who... We in Germany call Frühstücksdirektor, which means breakfast director. People who turn up, look at the newspaper, talk a bit smart, but all the decisions are made for them. And they only, a bit like a parrot, repeat what consultancy companies whisper in their ears or send them via email. And that has nothing to do with leadership. Leaders make decisions with all consequences involved. This is why you get paid for the job you do. Because only when you make decisions, people will perceive you as a leader. So when you look into... Taking all this together, when we look into step one, you look into educational biographies instead of label looking. Step number two, you implement a sustainable work culture, not a toxic one. Step number three, you only put people with real world experience and expertise in front of your peers or clients. And step number four, you end the political mandates. Leaders make decisions. If you decide to do that, you will have a better culture, you will have a better diversity, better work results, and people will be way more satisfied with you because they actually take you seriously. And of course, I published on this. Uh, so first, I have to say thank you again. We had uh, great rankings again this week. But when you now say, well, Neil, I simply have a couple of questions. Could you please help me somehow? Yes, I can. Um, just drop me an email, nb at nb-networks.com, and then we take it from there. Always happy to help. Very important is when you have something very specific, so you need someone for training, speaking, coaching, consulting, or mentoring, or you have project interim management, or you have an event where you say someone has to host it or uh, be the speaker there, just drop me a line and we take it from there. That's perfect. But when you only want to talk about your issues, that's perfect as well. And we just take it from there and have a nice chat or exchange our thoughts via email. Um, second step, I um, and that's something I really receive every week right now. People say, oh, I found this article, but there's a paywall. Can you send it to me for free? Uh, no, I can't because magazines make money. That's how it works. However, when you sign up at expert.nb-networks.com, then you receive an email every Wednesday morning. It's only one email. It's 100% content. It's an ad-free guarantee. And as soon as you sign up there, you get everything I published for free at no charge. So feel free to sign up and you are informed every Wednesday morning. It's just one email, nothing else. The third step, however, is the most important one. And the third step means to apply, apply, apply what you heard in this podcast. Because only when you apply what you heard, you will be able to see the positive change you want to have in your organization. I wish you all the best implementing these steps in your organization. I'm always happy to help. Just drop me a line and then we take it from there. And now at the end of this podcast, there's only one thing left for me to say. Thank you very much for your time.